Uh, we are in a series entitled Vintage Faith, and uh, we're looking at the book, uh, the chapter of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I want to begin this morning with this picture. And uh, most of you, or many of you, may recognize it from somewhere. It's an extremely popular photograph, and uh, it's, it's been sold uh, many times. It's entitled Grace, and it was originally a black and white photograph taken by a man named Eric Enstrom. Uh, it was believed to have been taken between 1918 and 1920 in his studio uh, located in Bovee, Minnesota. Uh, in 2002, uh, the Minnesota legislature made this the official photograph of the state of Minnesota. I, that probably gets your certificate. I don't know what else, but uh, I thought that was interesting. But Mr. Enstrom took this photo in his studio. The subject in the photograph is a man by the name of Charles Wyden. Charles Wyden earned his living as a peddler. Uh, He was a very poor man. He lived in a sod house. Uh, Later in 1926, uh, the photographer paid Mr. Wyden five dollars for the entire rights to the photograph. Uh, Later, when the photograph became very popular, Mr. Enstrom, the photographer, tried to track down Mr. Wyden, but he couldn't find him. And historians and even family members of Mr. Wyden have done some research. Nobody really knows what happened to him. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Enstrom, the photographer, licensed the photo first in 1930. In the 1940s, uh, the photographer's daughter hand-colorized the photograph. I thought it was a painting because when I was a kid, uh, this photo hung in one of my great aunt and uncle's house. That's where I remember it from. And I thought it was a painting. And so when I started doing research, I was like, you know, old guy praying painting, um, <laughs> Lord's Supper painting. Uh, and then it came up and then like everything else, Wikipedia told me off. But you can still buy this uh, on Amazon or eBay. You can still buy a print of that. Uh, It's very popular. And I bring this up because I think it relates to the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning. And we'll come back to it in a second, but I want to read for you some verses out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. I mentioned last week that beginning in verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6, at through verse 9 is the Shema. It's this daily recitation that many Orthodox Jews, even today, will still recite. And it talks about the Lord God is our God. He is one God. And then we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our, our, our mind. That's not the exact quote. It's soul and strength. But anyway... And then we pick it up here in verse number six. And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so... uh, this, this saying, this set of verses had be, has become very uh, familiar and very dear to the Jewish people. Moses was giving it to this generation about to go into the promised land. And he said, listen, he, he gives them what we view as the great commandment, right? What Jesus affirmed as the great commandment, that you're to love God with everything that you have and all that you are. And yet, and so Moses gives this command to the people, and then he says, listen, you've got to keep it before you all the time. You've got to tie it around your wrist. You've got to put it uh, between your eyes. You've got to put it on your doorpost. It needs to be a part of everything that you do. And so I want us to, to kind of break this down and look at this this morning and make application to our lives. And these words, Deuteronomy 6, 6, which I commanded you today, shall be in your heart. We talked about this a little bit in our connection group teaching last week, 
this idea that we, we use different parts of the body to sort of distinguish different things that we mean. You know, we'll, we'll often say about a decision, well, I went with my gut. Well, that's not physiologically true, but we understand what we mean. We talk about the heart as being sort of our emotional center. You know, we say, I love you with all my heart, or well, we have a broken heart. We talk about our head, our mind being our intellectual center, which uh, of course is more applicable to actual biology than our heart, which is really a muscle that pumps our blood, right? And yet we understand what we mean. And here, Moses says, these words need to be in your heart. You need to, to know them. They need to be dear to you. God speaks to us through his word, and his word is truth. Psalm 119 verse 160 says this, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. God's word is truth, and God speaks to us through his word. We have the written word of God left for us in the Bible, the Holy Bible. And then we have the incarnate word. We have the example of how we should live in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's word is truth. Jesus Christ being the word made flesh, he is truth. His words are truth. His actions are truth. And so we have the Bible and we have Christ as God's word that needs to be in our heart. Jesus in John chapter 17 prays his high priestly prayer. He prays this prayer for, his for himself, for his followers. And then he says he prays for his followers to come. But in verse 17, he says this, sanctify them by your truth. And he says, your word is is truth. God's word is the truth. And Moses says to the, to the generation about to go into the promised land, it's preserved for us today that these words, the commandments of God, need to be in our heart. They need to be a part of our life. And if we're not careful, we can look to other things excuse me, we can look to other things as being more authoritative than God's word. And that ought not to be. Listen, a, a preacher and a sermon are, are not any more authoritative than as they are based on the authority of, of, of the word of God. That The word of God is truth. My words, I, I want to make them truth, but you need to be cautious with that. Some other book about Jesus or scripture may help to enlighten Jesus and the scriptures for you, but it's not truth in the way that God's word is truth. And nothing that we find is truth unless it aligns with God's word. Because God reveals himself through the scriptures and through his son. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I was thinking about this a little bit, and I want to be careful because I don't want to offend you this morning, but I want to declare the truth. I remember it's been years ago. Uh, we had a gentleman in our church, he contracted cancer, a young guy, and it was, it was difficult to watch as the cancer just ate him away. And he was really just skin and bone, he was in his home, he was on hospice, and I happened to be there visiting him the day and the moment in which he passed away. And as a pastor, that wasn't the first time, unfortunately, that that circumstance has taken place, but I was there and, and he died. 
And there were medical professionals that were called in and they declared him dead and several of his family members were around and it was a small home in which he was, he w- which he was and, and I went outside and, and a couple of family members went outside with me and we just wanted to get some air and uh, stretch our legs a little bit. It had been a couple of hours and there as we walked and kind of made our way across the yard to the sidewalk and looked back at the house where he was, it was a beautiful day, but it was one of those days in Colorado where you've got some clouds rolling in. And it hadn't rained yet, but there were dark clouds behind the house, and there was a beautiful rainbow. And it was, it was gorgeous. And in the setting, and for the family, it was extremely emotional. Now, that's fine, but that rainbow is not the authority on which you should rest that God has told me that this person is in heaven. Now, I believe the the man who died, Darren, I believe he's in heaven by the testimony, the fact that we talk many times about how he knew Christ as his savior and that he would spend eternity in heaven. And that rainbow was beautiful and it felt good to see it. But that's not the authority of the truth of the word of God. You understand what I'm saying? It affirmed the truth that we knew. And so it was, it was great. But we can't rest on that event, on, on a natural event or an emotional thing. I know people that have, have relayed to me where they say, you know, preacher, I've been praying about something and, and God gave me a dream. And listen, God can speak to us in a, in a myriad of ways, and certainly in his word, he's spoken in dreams. But if that dream doesn't coincide with the truth of God's word, then I would question whether that dream is really from God, because God's word is truth. And so again, I'm not trying to, I don't want to offend you this morning, but you know, God has revealed himself through his scriptures and through Jesus Christ. Anything that contradicts with that is not from God because God's word is truth. And so something that contradicts with the truth is false. And so we need to understand that. And so Moses says, listen, these words need to be in your heart. God's word guides us. Psalm 119, 11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word helps us recognize sin and temptation and helps us to avoid it. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word guides us. It helps us to know where we ought to go and, and helps us to make decisions in our lives that, are, that will keep us on the path that God would have us to go. God's word guides us. It keeps us from sin and it keeps us doing the things that are right. If God's word is not in our heart, then our heart can betray us. See, I I think this is what can happen if we're not careful. We We can begin to look at other things and before we know it, God's word is not the, the, the guide in our life. God's word is not the standard of truth in our life. Other things are, and our heart can deceive us. Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. This, I think I've relayed this story before, but it's the most tangible or one of the most tangible illustrations of my life of frankly something that happens all the time, which is I sin and don't realize that I sin. I was uh, a youth pastor many years ago. Uh, I was at a camp and I kind of got in a conflict with this guy. Not, not, we weren't throwing punches or anything like that, but just kind of an argument. And I was convinced that I was right. And on the substance of the things we were talking about, I was right. But my attitude wasn't. And here's what happened. I didn't know that guy. I didn't see him. We didn't really resolve anything. Uh, Like a year later, I'm sitting in a conference and that guy walks in. 
And I hadn't thought about that confrontation. I hadn't thought about that guy in 12 months. And when that guy walked in the door, this is, listen, I know God speaks in a still small voice, but the Holy Spirit works with, in my life with gut punches because that's what I need. I'm telling you, when that guy walked in and I looked at his face, it was like the Holy Spirit went, Poof. I was like, oh, I owe that guy an apology. Like I wasn't godly in the way that I conducted myself towards that guy. I hadn't thought about it. I prayed, I'd read my Bible, I'd received communion. I mean, I was trying to live a godly life, but in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, you were wrong. And as soon as that first session was over, I had to get up and, and I, I, I apologized to the guy and he's like, I don't even remember what you're talking about. I was like, shoot, I could have just, you know, prayed for forgiveness or something, but that wouldn't have done it. I had to humble myself. And oftentimes, God will reveal himself and, 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 and communicate his truth to us. Because if we're not careful, our heart will deceive us. We'll think everything's good. We'll think we're, we're rolling along pretty good. And that's why we need God's word in our hearts. And then he says this in verse number seven of Deuteronomy six, you shall teach them these truths of God's word diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That phrase, you'll teach them diligently to your children. Uh, a literal interpretation is you'll sharpen them to thy children. I thought that was interesting. And then I remembered Psalm 127 that says this about children. Beginning in verse three, it says, Behold, children are an heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Here in Psalms, it says children are like arrows. And in Deuteronomy, it says you need to sharpen your children with the truths of God's word. And in that same context of Moses saying you need to instruct your children in the truths of God's word, he says this, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. We sitting around my house yesterday morning on kind of a lazy Saturday morning, and my son and daughter-in-law are with us right now for a few more weeks, and my daughter Kinsey's still at home, and I told him, I said, uh, the message I'm preaching tomorrow, I'm a little scared of because I'm going to talk about kids and God gave me three. And so I have to, it's a natural illustration and preacher kids love to be used as illustrations. I found out here's the truth. I'm far from a perfect father and my children are far from perfect children. I think I'm farther from a perfect father than they are from perfect children, just so you know. That's my wife's doing and grace of God in my life. But the one thing that I told my kids yesterday, and my daughter, my other daughter's at college, but I said, I hope that in your growing up, my two kids that are out of the house now, I recognize maybe I should have done this better. I know I should have, I should have instructed him in this way, or I should have been less harsh in this area. And I recognize weaknesses in my parenting. But I told my children, I said, I hope you know that your mom and I love Jesus Christ. And we don't just say we love Jesus Christ on Sunday, but we try to live that out all of the time. And that you see an example where we talk a talk and walk a walk that is consistent. And that is the greatest thing that we can give to our kids and to our grandkids. And Moses said, listen, this needs to be something that's happening all of the time. Being a Christian isn't a Sunday thing. It's, 
It's a seven day a week, 24 hour a day thing. And so we need to teach our children and we need to model what we teach. Psalm 78 verse one says, give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ear to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Here the psalmist says, uh, ooh. Here the psalmist says I'm going to say what my father has told me. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. And I like that phrase that the psalmist uses. He says, we're not going to hide it from our kids. I'll just give you a little of my wisdom that I think is based in God's truth. You can analyze it for yourself. Listen, you shouldn't give your kids the choice of whether they come to church or not. In my opinion. I don't think you ought to give your kids a choice of whether uh, they want to learn of Jesus or not. I don't give my kids a choice of whether they brush their teeth or not. I didn't, I didn't go to my kids when they were about five or six and go, hey, do you think you might want to pursue education? You know, because there's kindergarten, and I was thinking that you could learn to read and write. Some of my kids probably would have done that, but a couple of them might have been like, nah, I'm good. I didn't give them a choice. Why? Because I'm the parent. I have the responsibility. So I made them brush their teeth and I made them do certain things and they didn't always like it. And I made them go to school and I made them do their homework and when they didn't, they got in trouble. It was a super oppressive situation that they grew up in. But I did that because I loved them. And you know what? We never had a discussion about whether they were gonna go to church or not. This is what happened. We got up, they got up, we got ready and we went to church. You say, well, yeah, because you're the pastor. No, that's why I come to church. They come to church. That's a joke. Some of you will get it in a bit. It's because that's what we do. You know what we did when I wasn't a pastor? We still went to church. Because I think we need, the Bible tells us that we need to gather together. And it wasn't just on Sundays. We need to lead by example. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. I like that word, training. We have to train our children. We have to instruct them, and when they don't get it right, we've got to correct them. Not because we want to create little spiritual robots, but because as parents... God has entrusted us, and as grandparents, God has entrusted us with kids and their heritage, and we need to train them in the things that we know to be right. Listen, I I taught my kids things like telling the truth and working hard and trying to be good with money, all things that I think are important, but none of those things are more important than for, for them to have a relationship with Jesus. And so the truth of God's word needs to be in our family. And then finally this morning, the truth of God's word needs to dominate our life. Verses eight and nine of Deuteronomy six says this, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, the Jews took this literally. They would would take and write out fragments of scripture and they would, they would bind it on their wrist. They would, they, they would put it on their forehead. They would write it on their doorposts and on the side of their doorposts. The, oftentimes they would touch it as they went in and out. And it's easy to look at that and say, well, that's not exactly what Moses meant. And we're going to make some some spiritual applications, but as I thought about that, I thought, think about the things that we do. I don't own a lot of uh, jerseys or different sports uh, shirts. That's not really kind of what I do, but I do own a couple, and they are basically, I have sports, two sports teams. 
Number one, the Denver Broncos. And I, I, know that they're, I, I know that they're bad. But you know what? That's my football team. I grew up in Denver. I live in Denver. That's my team. You say, yeah, well, Denver. Well, I don't care. That's my team. And because of that, I hate the Raiders and the Chiefs. And if those are your teams, God bless you. But I'm just telling you, that's how I am. And I've got the Colorado Rockies. You say, oh, do you like the Rockies? Eh, my wife loves them. And when I go to a baseball game, I want to wear the home team. And so I have a couple of shirts and a hat. And I like the Rockies too. I just like to be, be contrary. And in my house, we have a little thing. How many days till opening day of baseball season right now? We count down to Christmas and then we count down to opening day. That's the way it works in my house. Why? Because I'm passionate about those things. Well, so could my kids grow up to be a Raider fan? I mean, I guess they could, but not in my house. Because that's important. But it's not as important as Jesus. And we would display that. Now, I don't have a big Broncos anything in my house anywhere, but if you go up to my office, uh, Jerry Perez works with metal, and he cut out a, a, a metal Bronco head, and that's in my office. It's awesome. It's cool. It's, not, it's in one of my bookshelves. And I've got some other Broncos things. Why? Because I'm passionate about that. You go over to another section of my office, and there's a, a picture there of my father on a motorcycle, on a police motorcycle, because my father was a policeman and he, and he rode motorcycles. And there's a little figurine of a police motorcycle and there's a couple other little Harley things there. And, and there's a picture, uh, there's two pictures of each of my daughters with me on the back of my motorcycles. Because that's something that I enjoy. And it's displayed in my space. The other prominent thing that's there, there's pictures of my kids all around the office and my wife because that's what I love. So think about what's in your home, what's in your office, what's in your space. And would someone look at that and know that you love Jesus? Now, that doesn't make you spiritual. I'm not saying you got to have a bunch of crosses or a bunch of scripture, but I'm saying if it's a part of your life, your personality, it's going to come through somehow. The things that you love and are passionate about are going to be displayed. And this is what the Jews did very quickly. Moses said it needs to be a sign on your hand. That's really the idea of work or action. Colossians chapter three and verse 23 says, whatever you do, do it heartily or with all your heart as to the Lord and not to men. The fact that we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ should affect our work, should affect the things that we do. He said, put it as frontlets between your eyes. This has the idea obviously on our head of our thoughts, but also our eyes, which give us direction. We, we look in the way that we go. Proverbs chapter six and verse 20 says, my son, keep your father's commands. Do not provoke the law of your mother or forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Proverbs 7 verse 1 says, My son, keep my words, treasure my commands within you. Keep my commandments and live. And my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your nearest kin. And so God's word and our relationship with God should affect our work. It should affect how we walk in the direction, how we think. And then finally, he says, write it on the doorpost and our gates. All of our activities, all of our comings and goings should be affected by our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Psalm chapter 121 verse 7 says, The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The, the, the word that just came to me as I studied and thought about this this week is the idea of saturation. Saturation. That as a follower of Jesus Christ, God and his word and our relationship with Jesus should saturate every part of our life. It ought to saturate our conversations. It ought to saturate our, our activities, our work, our hobbies, our relationships. God's word should saturate every part of our life. And Moses said to that generation going into the promised land, keep God's word in your heart. Let it be as you, as you go to sleep at night, as you wake up in the morning, teach your children and your grandchildren. This is God's command for us today, church. We need God's word. We need our relationship with Jesus Christ to saturate every part of our life. It doesn't mean that we're quoting scriptures every minute. It doesn't mean that, that we're preaching all the time in our relationships, but it, it should affect all of our relationships. It should have a difference. People at your work ought to know that you're a follower of Jesus. They know other things about you. They know other passions that you have, and, and following Christ needs to be the overwhelming passion of our life. I put a next step there just on your notes. Begin to implement habits to put God's word in your heart and your life. I just want to encourage you. If God's word is going to be in your heart, then get it in your heart. Read it every day. Memorize it. One of the most difficult things I think for especially adults to do is memorize scripture. And I talk to adults about this and they'll say, well, I just can't memorize things. And I'll be like, what was your childhood phone number? And they'll rattle it off. Or some song comes on the radio from 20 years ago and you know every word. We can memorize things that we're, that we're passionate about. And I'm not saying it's not difficult, but write those things on a card. Put them uh, somewhere where you'll see them all the time. Put them on the dash of your car. Put them in your office. Let God's word saturate your heart that we might walk in his commands. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your word, the way that it challenges us. God, the way that it corrects us that it keeps us from temptation and sin and the way that it guides us in the way that we should go. Lord, help us to be men and women of your word. Let your truth saturate every area of our life. God, reveal to us areas where your word and, and our relationship with you is not that way. Give us the strength and the courage to seek to develop habits that would make your commands more and more a part of our life. Bless us as we go from this place today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.